What if you had a guide who could tell you how to bridge a gap between who you are today and who you're destined to be? What if each week you could hear a story of someone who has tried and succeeded, or perhaps tried and failed, but learned something in the process? Limitless Spirit is a weekly podcast where host Helen Todd interviews guests about topics and personal stories on defining life's purpose, pursuing personal growth, and developing a deeper faith in Christ. But like, I remember my mom and my adoptive dad in the kitchen using drugs. So that led to, you know, wrong relationships and seeking love and acceptance and not knowing my worth and not knowing my value and still not knowing Christ. And, you know, so there was still drugs. I was still using drugs. I was still, I I didn't have the criminal activity element, but I was still addicted. I was still traumatized. I wasn't working through any of that. I was so close to converting to Islam. I mean, like I probably had one foot on the doorway of Islam. And that's when the Lord said, enough is enough, and set me on this course of learning what a relationship with Christ was. So rededicating my life, setting aside the drugs and the alcohol, and working through trauma. When you're in a difficult season in life, and your world seems to fall apart, and you feel broken beyond repair, sometimes it is difficult to recognize that God is still present in your life. And even the deepest pain has its purpose in your destiny. Welcome to the Limitless Spirit Podcast. I'm your host, Helen Todd, and my guest on this episode is Tamira Kirkland, an experienced social worker and adjunct professor at Liberty University and a missionary. Her childhood and upbringing set her up for a life of misery and brokenness. Her parents were drug users, and her father was an infamous drug dealer in New York City. But amid all the crime and drugs, the real danger to Tamara was growing up without feeling loved and cared for by her parents. As an adult, Tamara fell into drug use herself and lived with unresolved trauma, nearly joined Islam as a solution to her problems. But after a Christian co-worker encouraged her to attend church, Tamara slowly began to discover God and allow Him to redeem her past and change her future. After finding healing and calling in Christ, Tamira spent 18 years helping hurting people as a social worker for the state of New Jersey and now travels the world and shares the gospel as a missionary. In fact, on our recent mission trip to Moldova, she was able to share her testimony of redemption from drugs with a group of men at a drug rehab facility. In this episode, you will hear more about Tamara's story and how God can help you heal from the pain and brokenness of the past. Hello, Tamara. Welcome to the Limitless Spirit podcast. How are you doing? I am doing so well, Helen. Thank you so much for having me. Have you recovered from the jet lag? We were just together a few days ago in Moldova, of all places, and what a what an exciting trip! So, are you rested? Um, I'm rested, but I don't think I'm completely recovered. I'm still processing all that the Lord did and showed me. So, I don't know when that will ever take place. <laughs> oh, I, it takes time. It takes time. And and our trip, to be fair, was very, Im, very uh, packed with different things. And I think we were all stretched out of our comfort zone in more than one way. So I'm sure it's going to take time for you to process and, um, you know, look back at what took place. But I have known you for a, a few years and even been on more than one mission trip with you, but I got to learn something this time that I didn't know before. And that kind of got me all excited about doing an interview with you. And as you mentioned, you shared something that you have never shared before. So I think we should share it with our listeners here on the Limitless Spirit podcast. (laughs) Absolutely. Let's go for it. Let's do this, right? (laughs) So um, you grew up in quite interesting circumstances. Let's let's talk about that. Let's talk about that. Um, 
So let me say, I guess, first that many of the things that I'm going to share today, I probably only shared once or it's been in bits and pieces. Um, And so although I'm not worried, I'm not sure how it's all going to come out. And I feel like that is that is the piece that I'm like, I hope it makes sense because it makes sense in my head because it's my story. Um, So I just pray that it's conveyed well. So, uh, yes, I grew up in a household who the no one knew Christ. We kind of knew God, but we didn't know Jesus as our Lord and Savior. My mom uh, was a victim and now survivor of domestic violence um, on multiple occasions. My biological dad was a drug addict. He was addicted. He sold drugs for one of the larger drug lords in New York at that time. So we're talking uh, late 70s, early 80s. And so if you know New York City in that time, you knew and you know what was going on in that era. So that was my dad. Uh, My mom was addicted. So I was exposed to all sorts of things at all different points in life. So that was... How I started. Do you remember your biological dad? Oh, yeah. I mean, I know him. Um, we didn't always have relationship, but I will say that his family always made sure. So my paternal family always made sure that I knew them. So I have stronger relationships and bonds with like my cousins and like their first children. Uh, knew my granddad, knew my grandma on my paternal side, uh, but didn't always have relationship with my dad. But I knew him knew who he was, um, but just he wasn't present. He was absent because he was dealing with his own stuff. Like now at 45, I can say, I know what that was. Then I didn't know what it was. So was he in the house when you were growing up or he was absent? He was not in the house. Uh, My mom and dad were not married. So no, he was not in the house. He lived like locally, maybe three blocks over. I grew up in Jersey City, New Jersey. Um, So, you know, it's a city. Five blocks one way is really like a block, you know? So right. he was around. Yeah. So do you feel like uh, you lived in danger since he was dealing drugs? And I know what dangers come with that. Do you think looking back that you were living in dangerous circumstances? So um, in all fairness of him, um, I never saw him deal drugs, but I knew what he did. I found out later on what he did. So the danger wasn't from his criminal activity. The danger was what I now know was the absence of a father and all of those things that come with not having a dad to cover you and not having parents who knows Christ as their savior. So that's where the danger Uh, came in, not necessarily from the direct criminal activity. And what about your mom? You said she was also addicted. So um, was she a good mom? I mean, did she take care of you or not really? So no. So that's the, um, I guess the dichotomy of this whole thing is uh, my mom took Physical care of food, shelter, clothing, sent me to school. So this I've never shared. So this is going to be interesting. But she was addicted. She used drugs. I saw, I remember her and later on my adoptive dad. So my sister's biological father who legally adopted me um, would have what, what the old folks at that time called like get high parties sounds so crazy now as like a Christian, like, oh my gosh, why would you expose your kids to this? Um, But like, I remember my mom and my adoptive dad being in the kitchen with their friends, all using drugs. And my sister and I, and probably some other kids were in the living room, just kind of hanging out with one another while they were in the kitchen using drugs. And so uh, did that impact, you know, as you entered your teenage years and the adolescence and youth, how did that impact you, who you became at that point? So the impact wasn't necessarily in that younger stage of, of, of life. The impact came when my adoptive dad, who I knew as my dad because he loved me, he, you know, he was in the home. I saw him going to work. I knew we had food and provision. 
um, he died of an overdose. My sister was in the home when my adoptive dad died. So I can't even imagine the trauma that my sister still deals with because of that. But that is where like my trajectory changed. Like, you know, in the professional therapeutic circles, it's always, you know, like at what point did your life change? And for me, it was that point because of that grief and loss. Then it left me open to being sexually abused um, in my grandma's home by a family friend. And then that's when all of those other things took place. So now I have no dad covering me. I have no dad in the home. My mom is still struggling with just what I now know is the trauma of all of that. Um, and now I am 12, maybe 13, and I'm sexually promiscuous. I'm looking for a dad. I'm looking for love. All of those things that go along with all of that trauma that I just experienced. So that was what my adolescent life looked like. That is extremely tragic. And it seems like at that age, you know, it just no child should go through something like that. And yet looked like God's hand was on your life, uh, even through all of this. And so what happened next? So, I mean, there was a lot of trauma um, afterwards. I mean, we're talking me being, you know, 12, 13, living in a home with my mom um, and all of what that looked like, physical abuse, emotional abuse. And so that happened for years. So that led to, you know, wrong relationships and seeking love and acceptance and not knowing my worth and not knowing my value and still not knowing Christ and, you know, but always knowing. So, so the, the, the caveat to this, if I could step back for a second was I had a great aunt and she used to take me to church with her. So I remember this, she was, I was probably like five. So, you know, like those old pictures where you go to church and you got the church hat on and the little frilly dresses and all of that. So that was me. Later on in life, I realized that it was because of her obedience in taking me to this small storefront Pentecostal church in Jersey City that I believe that the call of my life was secured and I was separated in the spirit. And so the Lord knew that he was going to use me. But this life that happened in between all of that was like no one knew. So because of that, I always felt like I knew God. I always felt like I would never go without, right? Um, I always had this heart for other people because I guess maybe what I was going through or what I felt, I never wanted someone else to feel that. So it's that tension of life not knowing Christ, but this provision and this this calling and this separation being on your life and not even knowing what that was. So we go, you know, fast forward, I don't know, two decades or whatever, and I, well, not even that we go back. Cause then I meet my oldest daughter's dad and you know, it, I was still broken. I didn't even know what broken was broken. I, I'm still living in trauma, just trying to put life together. Um, and he was much older again, sold drugs in the local community, um, fast money, fast cars, fast lives. Um, I was very young and I got pregnant. And my oldest daughter is the outcome of that. I love her. I love her. I love her. (laughs) That is my baby. I love her. Um, Now, outside of Christ, that is my first love, right? So it's like my first, second love. But that was a relationship. And so, you know, it was that brokenness that just kind of continued through one marriage that didn't last, um, that was unevenly yoked. You know, so there was still drugs. I was still using drugs. I was still, I, I didn't have the criminal activity element, but I was still addicted. I was still traumatized. I wasn't working through any of that. And then one day at work, having a conversation with some folks and they said, oh, have you ever been to this church? This It's called Christian Love in Irvington. And it's like, no, oh, the pastor is great. You know, and, you know, he's really real. And he, you know, all of this, he's got this testimony. And I said, okay, I'm going to go one day. And the one day that I said I was going, I went. And that's when the Lord said, enough is enough and set me on this course of learning what a relationship with Christ was. So rededicating my life, setting aside the drugs and the alcohol and working through trauma and all of that to kind of 
get me to this point where I'm talking to you. And even in that, it's so much life and experience in between that. Amen. You know, it's really powerful, something that you mentioned, um, that even when you were broken, God was already working in, in your life. And it's so hard for people to accept this, especially I think people who have gone through trauma in their childhood and adolescence and, and you know, the natural inclination is to say, God, where were you? Why did you allow me to go through this? You know, and it is a hard, hard reality to deal with. But then to know that God, even in that, he separated you and he had his hand on you. That That is very powerful. And I think um, it's uh, hopefully could speak to someone who may have gone through something similar to what you have gone through. But um, so what happens next? Was this that next moment when your life changed? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> it was not. So I think at this point, I am um, now trying to figure out how to get out of this first marriage because it's just not working. So I'm no longer addicted. I'm no longer using drugs. So I have a different perspective. I have clarity in life. Um, I'm not. Anywhere where I think I should be, I don't even know where should be is in terms of destination, but I know that this isn't it. Um, And so I start really seeking God, like, what is this? I don't like this. I don't like using drugs. I don't want to be in this relationship. And he was a Muslim. So we need, so that's a whole conversation within itself. And what's so ironic in the saving factor of how God's grace is so Amazing. So we go back to this conversation of me understanding or not even understanding the call and the separation that he had placed his hand on my life to then be in a relationship, a marriage with a man who is an unbeliever. Even at that point, still not having identity, still not understanding worth, still looking for a father's love through a natural man. I was so close to converting to Islam. I mean, I was super close. I mean, like I probably had one foot on the doorway of Islam. Like, and 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 I tell this story and it's so ironic. The Holy Spirit is so amazing because I knew this was going to come up. <laughs> I knew this conversation was going to come up today. So the Holy Spirit is so amazing. And he's like, when he has you and you have been chosen by him, when you have been called and separated by Christ, there is nothing that anyone could do to like pluck you out of his hand, right? Like that scripture. So I was reading books. I was, uh, you know, learning about what this, you know, Muslim faith was, what it means to be a woman of this faith. And I tell you, Helen, he gave me a book to read. And I was like, that's not the truth. Like, and to this day, I've had several people of the Islamic faith say to me, what book was it? Like, what book did 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 he give you that caused you to turn away from this? I want to ask this question. <laughs> that was going to be my next question. <laughs> and to be so honest, I don't remember the title of the book. I know it was like a, it, it was like very scientific based. And I, I was like, this is not the truth. And it is, it is because of that book that I was like, oh, I definitely can't go here. I need, I, I don't know where I'm going with this God and this Christ thing, but I'm surely not going that way. Wow. So it wasn't the book. It was the Holy Spirit. It didn't matter what book it was. <laughs> Amen. 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 Wow. But the Holy Spirit said, no, 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 no. Because he knew the Holy Spirit knew, oh, she's getting ready to jump over. Give her this book. So wow. my ex-husband thought he was giving me this book because he was doing what we were supposed to do as Christians. Right. We were evang- we we're supposed to evangelize. So he right. was doing what he was supposed to do. And I said, oh, no, no, no. The Holy Spirit was like, give her the book. That is her defining moment in this part of my story. So I say that to say, you know, in, in terms of redeeming and redemption, he uses all things for his glory. Amen. All of it is used for his glory. Even the things that you think 
can't be used. Even the things that you're like, there is no way Christ is going to use that he used. Nothing goes to waste. Nothing goes to waste. So then what happens? I mean, I'm sitting at the edge of my seat. It's like a movie, really. <laughs> it is. It really is. Um, um, the book of Tamara. So so at that point, I, I get the, the, the confidence and the bravery to leave um, and to separate and eventually, you know, divorce from my now ex-husband. And then the Lord just puts me on this path to him. And so it's at the church that the Holy Spirit sent me to um, initially is where I've learned to fast. It's where I learned to pray. It's where I learned to read and seek the Lord. It's the place where I first heard the Lord's audible voice um, during um, what we call like a shut-in. I don't know if any of your, you know, listeners knows what a shut-in is. It's basically when you stay in church all night and you pray and you sing and you meditate, you know, but you like, that's it. It's just you and the Lord. Um, And it was New Year's Eve and I heard the audible voice of the Lord. And what I heard was Romans 12 and two. And I remember, cause I was, I was asleep. I was, I was a babe. I wasn't, I didn't know how to stay up all night and pray. (laughs) And so I jumped up out the pew and there was no one there. Like people were praying, but there was no one in the immediate area to have said that to me. And I knew it was the Lord. And so that is forever like my favorite scripture, because that is the first time that the Lord spoke his voice to me. And I understood it to be Christ, the Holy Spirit speaking to me. So we fast forward um, some years and we're just doing that, you know, the thing that the Lord calls us to do, working out our soul salvation. And so, you know, that means working through trauma. And I've been on plenty of therapist couches and chairs and, you know, working through family generational trauma and personal trauma and things that I've done to myself and, you know, praying and and just seeking the Lord to do, to be Christ-like. And now I'm here talking to Helen Todd. I mean, it, it, it's really, it, that's what it is. And now I'm here. And now I'm like a missionary. Who would ever thought? <laughs> like a missionary. You are a missionary. <laughs> I'm just thinking, you know, you growing up with the parents who were addicts, dealers, um, witnessing uh, or, you know, experiencing your Mm -hmm. stepfather Mm -hmm. die of overdose. And Mm -hmm. years later, God brings you to Moldova to the drug rehab with only men. And and you're able to bring up this part of your past and speak into their lives. You know, like you say, nothing in your experience goes to waste. You did not know back then how that experience is going to be used, you know, but um, that that is just remarkable. Um, another part of your story is, so through all that, you become a social worker. And this is, I mean, if now that you're able to look back, you know, doesn't it all make perfect sense you having to deal with broken lives basically on a daily basis, um, you know, who who can be better qualified and equipped to do that than a person that has been restored from brokenness, not just experienced brokenness, it's not the same, but a person who experienced the restoration from brokenness. Amen. Amen. I often laugh. I often laugh um, at the Holy Spirit because I was not just a social worker. I was a child protective social worker in New Jersey in many of the urban cities. Uh, So it was very common for me to walk into someone's home and know what things looked like that other people may not have caught on to or saw. I often laughed that now the restoration of the Lord, because I've surrendered and said, yes, he provided for me. And it wasn't even like work sometimes. Sometimes I felt like I was going to have conversations with friends and sisters the same way I'm sitting here having this conversation with you. I was able to have conversations with many of the families that I 
had contact with. And so I was able to understand, I get it. I understand what this looks like, but we can't do this, whatever that thing this was for that family. We can't do this. How can we do things better? I would come home, I mean, amongst the tears and the crying, and I don't know if I can do this. And, you know, all of that, that all of us experience as a CPS worker. But I would often laugh like, Jesus, you love me so much that you are now giving me provision in the same areas that I was broken. And that is the redeeming factor of nothing goes to waste because I understand what that is. I understand how we get there. But I also became um, the living epistle and, and, and the testimony of you don't have to stay there because there is nothing in my life that indicated that I would be here today. Nothing. I remember sitting at work when I was towards the end of my CPS career at the hotline. So when people in the community have problems with families or they think there's something going on, they call the 800 number. I was one of those people for New Jersey. And I remember getting a call about a family, same age as me, grew up in the same town. Our first children were maybe days apart Lives in terms of place and location and times mimicked one another. We probably even walked the same streets together at some point. And her life was totally different. She went to prison. She had children removed. She had children die because of substance abuse and just neglect and abuse. And I remember the the day I took that call, I sat there and I cried because it was in that moment that I realized and I understood the difference of being called and separated and and saying, and and someone being responsible to say, I'm going to take her to church. I'm going to, you know, show her the gospel. I'm going to show her, you know, even if it's just children's church, right? Like taking me into that environment where people, where believers could see something that my parents couldn't see to pray into to separate me unto the Lord so that even through all of this life, I would come out on this end because that, uh, that family that I took the call on, it could have been me. There was no reason why it should not have been me except for the Lord, except for Christ and all of his glory and all of his saving and the blood and all of that. There is no reason why I should even be sitting here. There's people probably who never even would thought that I would be sitting here but Jesus. That is very, very true. I know that in, um, I want to come back to this actually, but I have one more question. So I know that as a social worker, you probably were very limited um, in being able to share Christ with people because that's not your function. But did you have a situation where you were able to maybe encourage someone or point them in the right direction because of your faith? Um, Absolutely. And I think that's where the gifts and talents come in, right? So we all have gifts and talents and, you know, some people could sing and some people can play an instrument. And for me, it wasn't that. For me, my gifts and talents are being able to speak to people. Like Paul says, like to the Jews, I became a Jew. And like, I, I was able to speak the language. And so, I was able to not necessarily preach the gospel per se, chapter and verse, but the Lord had instilled in me and given me knowledge and word that I could use in my conversation and then say, like, I remember sitting in in, in a family's home and um, <laughs> I remember I said to the to the mom who was 22, I said, choose ye today who you are going to serve. You're either going to serve the streets and all of this, or you're going to serve your children in righteous manner. Now, I couldn't say Christ, but that was what I could say. And she understood what I was saying. So I think when we have truly surrendered to Christ and we've said yes, we don't have to be you know, the most eloquent of speakers. We don't like he gives us the language, right? Matthew 10 says, you know, don't worry about what you're going to say until that hour. I will tell you what to say in that hour. And so it's those moments that you learn to weave your testimony with social work, with the gospel, because not for nothing, 
Christ was the first social worker. Like we are his hands and feet and that's what social workers are supposed to be. And so you are able to weave all of that in. So no, I've never necessarily like shared the gospel per se, but I definitely showed up and was Christ-like and they knew that, oh, there's a difference with her. There's a difference in that worker. Can I speak to this worker? Even if it wasn't my case, I was buddying with someone. They would be like, well, I want to speak to that one. But I knew it was because of Christ and the love because there was no judgment. I was able to walk into people's homes and just love on them despite all of the stuff. There was no shame. There was no condemnation. I remember walking into a woman's home. She had no furniture and she was so embarrassed. And I said, give me the milk crate. I'll pull up a crate. And she looked at me like I was crazy. And I said, what? I've sat on a milk crate before. And I sat on a milk crate and conducted the interview with no problem. So I think it's, 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 again, it goes back to God uses everything. There is nothing that we have gone through. So there's nothing that you have experienced in life that he will not use at some point in your life. He's going to use it all, all of it. That is very true. And so what I wanted us to talk about is, you know, there is a saying, hurt people hurt people. And when you go through abuse, when you go through trauma, it, it ends up in the natural. It ends up turning you into person who perpetuates that and in turn hurts people. But it doesn't have to be that way. And when Christ is in the equation, and like you said, your life becomes surrendered to him There isn't a trauma that he cannot heal. He can restore you into a person who doesn't hurt other people, but who builds them up. And and it is very important, I think, to understand that and trust him enough to do that. Uh, Because there is a level of trust, I think, there to believe, have faith that God can, because that past hurts. You can't erase it. It's there. It's, It's not going away. And it can eat you from inside. So what advice would you give people who struggle with that, you know, struggle with allowing God to redeem their past? First, you have to acknowledge that there is God and his son Christ came to this earth. Without that, we can't go any further. So so we have to have like that basic foundational, Christ is my savior. But that's just eternity, right? It's not abundant living. You get the abundant living through then trusting him. And so what I would say to someone is, if you look over your life, and I used to have a pastor that said, if you turn to page 455 of my book, (laughs) you know, we don't know what we're going to see. But it's so if you look over the course of your life and you realize that if you've been doing everything in your own strength, in your own way, in your own power, without having a guiding force, without having Christ order your steps, where has it gotten you? Let's be honest. And if you're honest, you say it's not gotten me very far because I'm still bitter. I'm still angry. I'm still, I I have unforgiveness and all of those things. So what do you have to lose? Just give it to Christ. He died on the cross. And even if you don't take it as far as he he died on a cross, his word says, come to me, all who are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Give it to him. I don't know about you, but it, so it's sort of like if you're carrying groceries in, right? And so we all want to be strong and, and, oh, I got it. But if your husband comes in and says, babe, give me the bags, I'm going to toss the bags over. I'm not going to struggle <laughs> with the groceries. Let Christ take the bags from you and you just walk alongside him. But at some point you have to trust. But I understand that it's hard, especially if you don't have a dad or family that covered you in that loving manner. So then you've got this duality of, well, all of these other people hurt me and I can't even see this God you're talking about. How am I supposed to trust? Well, if you know man has hurt you, why not trust this person that you technically can't see but moves through people? Give it to them. Give it to God. Let him walk you through piece by piece. Doesn't You don't have to dump everything. You can. But he's so gracious. He's so powerful. He's so all-knowing. 
that he can handle whatever it is. He can handle your cries. He can handle your hard questions. He can handle your backsliding. He, there is nothing that he can't handle, but you have to want to give it over. You have to get to a point in your life where you are tired of being tired. You are tired of being angry. You are tired of being bitter. You are tired of your relationships not working. You are tired of you not being able to talk to your kids. You are tired. Like you have to get to the point where you have had enough and you don't know what else to do. When you get to that point, then you say, Christ, Jesus, dad, Abba, I'm ready. I can't do this anymore. And he'll come in and he will start lifting things. He'll start putting people in your path to help you work through that. And I think that's my word of advice because that's what I had to do. I had to get to a point where it was like, I don't know what else to do. I don't know. But I got, but I got tired, Helen, of being angry. I got tired of being mad and bitter about folks who was living their life. They out here living their whole life and I'm sitting up here mad and bitter. I couldn't do it anymore. So that would be my advice. Trust Christ. I think this is excellent. And I think we experienced an example on our mission trip when our youngest missionary, a 16-year-old girl, um, told us how she gave to God the hurt of being abandoned by her mom. I tell you, her story brought me to tears. I think every one of us was weeping, but at 16, she was able to do that. What you are just talking about, it made me think of that, you know, and if she can do it, anyone can do it. And so I, I think you nailed it. It's right on. Just care, give this these bags of groceries to Jesus and let him carry your load. That is the answer. Thank you so much, Tamara. That has been a great conversation. I know that it's going to speak to someone today. And in the meantime, I look forward to more missions adventures with you and, and just how God is going to continue to use you all over the world for his glory glory. Amen. Thank you so much. This has been such an awesome experience. Um, it's been a great experience to be able to share uh, who I am and how I got to be who I am through Christ. Um, so thank you so much. And I'm sure we will see each other and work alongside each other in the field very soon. I loved what Tamir said. Nothing in your past goes to waste. Your pain has a purpose not only as a part of your personal growth, but also as a path to help someone else experience a breakthrough. Tamir's testimony is a reminder that God is always working in our lives, even when we don't feel it or see it. His plans are greater than ours. He always makes our path straight when we follow Him. And if you are struggling today with your past, if you don't feel whole, it is time to allow Him to do His work in you and use you for His glory and for building His kingdom. At World Missions Alliance, we believe that changed lives change lives. If you would like to learn more about what we do and how you can fulfill your greater purpose, visit our website, rfwma.org. If you enjoy this podcast and it brings you joy, it encourages you in your faith, I invite you to consider supporting it financially. Any gift that God places on your heart can help us continue to produce more episodes and reach the world with the good news of Jesus Christ. You can donate by, again, going to our website, rfwma.org slash forward give and donate there. Thank you for listening. Until next time, I'm Helen Todd. Limitless Spirit Podcast is produced by World Missions Alliance. We believe that changed lives change lives. If you want to see your life transformed by Christ's love, or if you want to help those who are hurting and hopeless and discover your greater purpose in serving Christ through short-term missionary work, check out our website, rfwma.org, and find out how to get involved.